the symposium so we can we can have some of that. And of course, you guys are always welcome, welcome to call me or email me if you need something. Um, with that, um, I'll go ahead and get started with the lecture. Uh, motivational interviewing is something you might have heard of before. Um, what I'd like to, for everyone to, to kind of do is have an open mind to some of this information. While some of it may resonate with you, you might have questions and we're welcome to answer as many of those as we can within the time that we have. And it's gonna be a combination of uh, me explaining what motivational interviewing is, what it's used for, um, where it comes from, uh, and some of the aspects of it. So you'll be able to um, utilize this as an intervention in just about any setting you're in right now. It isn't exclusive, um, it's exclusively the right of mental health professionals like myself. Uh, you can use it in all kinds of different capacities and the work that you do, even with your interaction with your friends and family and yourself. That's the beauty of motivation or interviewing. And you might've kind of guessed by the name, it's a way for you to interview an, an individual or, or have a dialogue that elicits motivation from that person. Um, a lot of it comes from the work of, uh, anybody know who this guy is? You get like brownie points if you know anybody. I know there's some folks from, from Nevada State College here this evening, they might know. Yeah, Felicia got it right away. You're my new favorite student, Felicia. Uh, Carl Rogers, yeah. So uh, Carl Rogers developed um, his theory of uh, uh, client-centered or person-centered therapy. Um, and a big component of that was compassion. And the, anybody know the three tenets of uh, person-centered care? or client-centered. Yeah, I know, I know Gerardo knows, but I wanna see if anybody else does. Somebody's probably Googling it right now. Um, genuineness, empathy, she's close. There's one more. Dignity, respect. Yeah, those are kind of, there's these three core ones. Those are inclusive, uh, uh, Mary Janae, but uh, it is not the three core ones that I was looking for. Genuineness, empathy, Congruency. Congruency, I think that would be it. Autonomy, those are um, not non judgmental. Yeah, unconditional positive regard. We got it. We did it together. Okay, cool. This is fun. Rogers is one of my favorite theorists and um, researchers. He was a, a practitioner in his time, and he's one of our what we call master therapists who really influenced the field in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and what was Motivational interviewing was developed out of uh, Roger's work, um, and we'll 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 see a short video about um, a researcher that uh, that applied that work and, and developed motivational interviewing, kind of formalized it into a into more of a protocol that makes it easier for us to replicate across different disciplines, uh, different clinical settings, and it's been applied to schools to criminal justice systems. Um, it, it just goes on and on and on. Um, and so it's pretty uh, interesting. And some of the work that I did, um, I work with a, a, uh, a federal grant through SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration. The feds dole out money to research groups and universities. When I was at UNLV, we had a three-year group, excuse me, a three-year grant that was over a million dollars. And we went out into the community and trained people how to do motivational interviewing from all different disciplines. It could have been doctors, nurses, um, dentists, uh, all healthcare providers that didn't know how to talk to people about their substance abuse issues. Um, and they didn't really know what to do with them when they figured out they had them. So we spent three years doing that and actually trained a number of the nursing uh, faculty and uh, students uh, a few different times um, as I've been invited as a guest lecturer and I was a favorite talk, but talk, topic of mine to deliver. Y'all have to forgive me, I haven't lectured in <laughs> over a year now. So, and I don't even talk to people that much on a daily basis because everything's online now. So I'm a, a little rusty, but I'll warm up, don't worry. Um, so as part of that grant that was called ESPERT, um, uh, they include um, motivational interviewing training to a limited degree. But for today's um, purposes, there's a short video, it's about six minutes, and it was uh, developed by the University of Missouri, 
And I was actually trained directly by those folks, great group of researchers and trainers. And um, they did our train the trainer series and which I replicated uh, later time at different uh, colleges and universities. And um, this is a short video they have on kind of shows how expert and motivational interviewing help um, and impact uh, our clinical field and mental health and the communities in general that we serve. So let's spend a few minutes uh, watching this together and then we'll have a little Q&A and then we'll get on with the lecture. So let me pull this up here. Everyone can see that. Let's see, I've lost my... Can you see that, Gerardo? I'm gonna ask you just because I can't see myself. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then just let me know if you can uh, hear it once I start it. All right. We all know alcohol and substance abuse is a problem that affects more than just the users. When you consider the number of people affected, changing those numbers might seem insurmountable, but it's not. As healthcare providers, we are perfectly positioned to do something about it. That's why we all need to be adept at identifying and addressing alcohol and drug problems. Wait, aren't these things somebody else's problems? Furthermore, why should we care? First, we should care because alcohol and drug problems are common. Studies have shown the prevalence of substance misuse is higher than what we're currently addressing. Our primary focus here is the 20% of people who are at-risk users. These users include the one out of six patients you see that has had at least one episode of binge drinking in the past 30 days. One out of 12 patients meets the standard diagnostic criteria for an alcohol use disorder and one out of 50 meets those diagnostic criteria for a current drug use disorder, including illicit and prescription drugs. Oh, but I don't have any of those people in my practice. Think again. We all see patients who have these problems, even though the problems are often hidden. Why should we care? Because alcohol and drug problems are serious. Alcohol and drug problems cause or complicate a lot of chronic diseases and acute problems. Half of all trauma center visits are alcohol related. And substance misuse increases an individual's risk of several chronic diseases. Chances are you're already treating these people. Furthermore, alcohol consumption results in over 100,000 deaths each year in the U.S and ranks third in preventable deaths following tobacco and poor diet and inactivity. Why should we care? Because alcohol and drug problems are also expensive. Substance abuse is a problem that everybody pays for. Federal and state governments spend at least $373 billion a year on substance abuse. That's $1,486 per person in the U.S. Furthermore, of the total substance-related spending, less than 2% is spent on prevention and treatment, while almost 96% is spent on the collateral damage from alcohol and drug abuse. Shoveling up this wreckage puts a huge strain on the budgets of much-needed programs, including government-funded health care, which must cover most of the burden. This cost is funded by your tax dollars. Okay, so these problems are common, serious, and expensive. So what? There's nothing I can do about them anyway, right? Actually wrong. There are things you and I can do that make a difference. With adept training, small conversations result in big impacts. An important part of adept is ESPERT, a proven method for addressing substance misuse in routine medical care. ESPERT stands for screening, brief intervention, referral, and treatment. The main focus of ADEPT training is screening and brief intervention. The first and most important step is screening for risky behavior. A person doesn't have to be addicted to be in a risky category, and any use of tobacco, illicit drugs, or prescription drug misuse is considered risky. Solid population-based evidence sets low-risk drinking limits for men at no more than four drinks in a day and no more than 14 in a week. 
For women and for men over 65, low-risk limits are no more than three drinks in a day and no more than seven in a week. A lot of people are surprised at how low these limits are, but the science is solid. Anything more than these limits is a positive screen. And with a positive screen, it's time for a brief intervention using motivational interviewing techniques we'll learn later in the ADEPT training. But that conversation would just be too uncomfortable. My patients would just lie. They'll think I'm accusing them. But the vast majority of patients say, My doctor should feel free to ask me how much alcohol I drink. If my doctor asked, I'd give an honest answer. If my use affects my health, my doctor should advise me. Moreover, there's good evidence from many randomized clinical trials that if we just talk with the risky user about cutting down or quitting, 20 to 30 percent will do it. These conversations also reduce the risk of another ER visit for trauma. As you've seen, most of the time and energy put into substance misuse is responsive, reacting to the physical, social, and economic consequences Adept is changing all that. Instead of cleaning up the wreckage, we're getting in front of the train and steering it along a safer route. Learning a few simple skills can make these conversations quick and comfortable for you, and more importantly, helpful for the patient. Okay, so just a great little uh, kind of presentation on how effective these kinds of skills and interventions when they're widely used can really have an impact on lowering risk, uh, improving outcomes. And you know, the crazy thing is, is that a lot of medical providers, well, I, I will just say, if you've, if you've taken two sem one semester of the human services program, the first semester, you have more training than medical doctors do in substance abuse counseling and, and, and nursing students. So think about that. Now, um, a lot of, uh, as you, you saw, and as you know from the, some of the research that you're presented in our coursework, a lot of substance abuse uh, is, not, is, is never um, addressed. They don't go in for treatment. They're not aware of treatment that's available. They're not even, they don't even recognize sometimes they have an issue. Uh, so this is a big problem. So what we're trying to do, um, is across disciplines is add these kinds of interventions that are proven to work, that are evidence-based, research-based, show um, positive outcomes, that if we train not just mental health counselors, substance abuse counselors, um, but um, other, other professionals like nurses, doctors, dentists, and like uh, healthcare workers, community healthcare workers, folks at all different levels, can have these conversations. And if they're trained with these simple tools, they can have a, a, a greater impact on reducing the severity of these very common issues in, in our communities. It's, it's really a big problem. It's like um, I was talking to, when I gave this to a group of nurses, there was a nurse who had been practicing for like 40 years. And she said that, you know, we didn't used to take blood pressure and temperature readings all the time. And it became common practice. And so what, you know, once they did that, they started being able to, um, to identify early on folks with heart issues or high blood pressure that were uh, candidates for strokes and things like that. So they, I don't know if you were, when I was growing up in, in, this, in the 70s, you know, guys my age, in their 40s, would have heart attacks and drop dead all the time. And that's just not very common anymore because we have better screening for that. Um, and so we'd like to add these kinds of, you know, what I would consider basic screening tools to, across um, healthcare providers so that we can start um, providing care early on because the earlier we address it, but the, you know, everybody doesn't, people don't have to hit rock bottom. That was the old kind of uh, 12 step model and belief system that people had to get there before they started to change. But a lot of times folks are, they don't realize all of it. You know, you tell people, you know, this level on drinking uh, is unhealthy, unsafe, and it adds to lots of different other problems. And that if just with those kind of suggestions, in some instances, people will reduce their their intake. Um, some won't, but we're 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 moving the needle, right? And that's what the important thing is. 
especially uh, as public health becomes a greater and greater issue in this country and worldwide. We're gonna not have to just treat illnesses, we're gonna have to find ways to prevent them. Um, and in our bachelor's program, uh, for those of you folks who are interested, we have uh, a prevention uh, course that helps introduce you to methods and, and, um, and practices for, for, for prevention. And um, a lot of those you'll see uh, start in schools and things like that. So um, just moving along here, uh, this is Bill Miller. He is the, he would be considered the father of motivational interviewing. And I, this is the, these are the only two videos we're gonna watch, but they're kind of back to back. So uh, I try to keep them short. We're gonna watch about mm, eight to nine minutes of uh, Dr. Miller uh, directly addressing um, how he kind of um, discovered and then uh, researched uh, his discovery and then uh, was able to prove his hypothesis and then develop uh, these tools out of, uh, out of that research. A uh, great guy, I had the pleasure of meeting him one time and he was a very uh, kind, charming, uh, graceful man and gave me his time and for nothing that I just invited him to go have a cup of coffee with me. I was really fortunate. Uh, I think he's retired now. He, He's probably in his 80s, if, I, if, if I'm right. Um, but let's, I'm gonna queue up another video here, but before we do that, um, I don't know if uh, Gerardo's caught up with questions here. Is there anything specific you'd like to address? Um, I think that, it, that as we watch the video, we start realizing that MI serves as a very proactive and a preventative way of supporting people. Even if they are not drinking at that point, it, it is a great tool to continue supporting. So at very early stages. And even though that they are already either using a drug or not, MI continues to be a, a beautiful tool to support them. Yeah, it's so useful. And you know, one of the reasons I'm really passionate about introducing MI to my program, I call it my program, but it's our program. <laughs> I just developed, it's like my baby. So I'm, I'm very, uh, uh, protective of it uh, is because I didn't get MI till after graduate school. Imagine that. And I was trained as a substance abuse counselor and a mental health counselor in my graduate program. And I didn't get it till probably a year into my practice. And I was thinking, where has this been the whole time? So ever since then, you'll see it pop up in your coursework because I look for texts books that address this um, to add that to the coursework that we're developing. All the coursework that we put into the courses is fresh, it's relevant. This isn't a, um, a theories uh, a program. This is an uh, applied science program. So we take the, the, the most up-to-date research that we can find. I mean, it's not always up-to-date because you know, it takes time to get in textbooks and things like that. Um, but we also use um, journal articles and things like that that are relevant and add that to the coursework because I remember studying my psychology uh, undergraduate program and I was studying like the history of of psychology and you know uh, Mesmer this guy who was like a charlatan and all this kind of and it was great you know it was interesting in a way but then when I got out of uh, my undergrad I didn't know I didn't have any way to apply it these programs are specifically designed upon graduation from either um, our certificate programs at different levels associates and bachelors that you can apply what you've the 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 research that supports the human services profession, which is psychology, sociology, anthropology, all those kind of sister social, uh, psychological uh, research domains are amalgamated into human services and, and, and applied towards practice for client care. Now, um, so I, it, it, it motivated me to change that, that way of introducing students to information after the fact, you know, I was like, this needs to be done early on. Um, let's take a, oh, somebody, uh, is that Ashley? The name's truncated, so I can't see. Ashley Bogdan said, I have to agree with Caleb. If all I do, I help one person, the money and time I put to your degree is worth it. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. When I saw that comment, I thought that's, she's at the heart of a therapist. And this is the kind of folks that we need to come into the profession because they recognize that, that money and um, 
and do doesn't mean anything in the terms of a human life. That if you can help one person, if we can all just help one person, then we could change the world in a, in a very profound and meaningful way. And of course, we'll get to help uh, thousands of people over the course and of our uh, and uh, lifetime of our professions. And, you know, I notice I get a lot of satisfaction from teaching because I see comments like that continually through your coursework, in your discussion posts, in your papers, um, in your assignment submissions. I read all that stuff and when I'm grading it and I, 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 I can see that you guys are on the right path, that, that, the, that you kind of people with hearts who come into this profession and, and, and into our programs because they're interested in helping people. They're interested in changing the world. They're, they're, they don't want to just stand by while these terrible things happen. They want to do something about it. And the time that we have and the energy that we have to put into the world um, can do that. Uh, but if, and, and too many people do stand by and don't do anything. So I, I love to hear that. And thank you for that uh, comment. I'll, I'll, I'll always remember that. Um, so uh, with that introduction here, we'll um, uh, introduce Dr. Bill Miller from University of New Mexico, and we'll watch about eight, 10 minutes of, of him. I'll, I'll cut it off when I think it's about right. And if you average all the therapists together, I think we just rank ordered the therapists. Oh. Another study with the, what was happening and what their hopes and thoughts in the world of alcohol and drugs, eloquent voice of uh, Mr. And it's the story of motivational interviewing, which started out working with some of the most despised and rejected members of our society. With those missing fathers you've been hearing about who are lost in the world of alcohol and drugs. And then with uh, mentally ill, chemically, chemical abusers, isn't that an awful name for people? You know, like uh, with those with uh, HIV and at risk of it and now has spread into the fields of public health and probation and parole. And it's a kind of interesting winding story. It's not one that, that happened by forethought at all, but in sort of unexpected serendipitous ways. So I want to tell you how it's unfolded and where we are at the moment and express my gratitude for a, a career built on projects. Uh, 25 years of funding from the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and uh, Alcoholism and NIDA and with thanks to my colleagues at the University of New Mexico Center on Alcoholism and Substance Abuse and Addictions, uh, who were very instrumental in all of the research that you're going to see. The story really begins in Milwaukee in 1973 when I was on an internship and wandered into an alcoholism treatment unit, knowing absolutely nothing about alcoholism. The director of the program said, what do you know about alcoholism? I said, no, nothing. What, what do they teach you in graduate school? Nothing. Uh, he said, well, you're going to need to know about this because it's the second most common diagnosis you're going to see in your lifetime, so you better learn about it. So I spent that summer listening to people on the, on the ward. Uh, I didn't know anything, and so I had nothing to, to, uh, to offer, but I put on my best Carl Rogers hat and, and listened to the stories of these men, primarily, who were, who were there in this VA hospital, and how they'd gotten there and where they thought their lives were going and what was happening and what their hopes and dreams were. Uh, and I loved it. There was an immediate chemistry of working with, with people with alcohol problems for me. Uh, and then I went home and started reading the literature on alcoholism and it said uh, alcoholics are in denial, they're pathological liars, you can never get through to them, they're huge walls of defensiveness that you have to use a bulldozer to break down. And I said, gosh, those aren't the same people I was talking to. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't sound like alcoholics in Milwaukee are, are like that. Well, I went back to the University of Oregon and decided to do my dissertation working with, uh, with problem drinking. And one of the annoyances was that the control group seemed to work as well as the, uh, as the intervention group in the study that I did. And uh, specifically in a, in a follow-up study, we randomly assigned people who, were, who had drinking problems to come in and see a counselor who was doing behavior therapy for 10 weeks or to be randomly assigned uh, to a group that worked on their own with materials that we gave them said, take this home and, uh, and follow directions and we'll be in touch with you in 10 weeks and see how you're doing. And uh, the, the self-help materials eventually were published as, uh, as a, this book, now called Controlling Your Drinking. And those who saw a therapist showed a nice decrease in their drinking. You see their, their alcohol use is cut down by half and down into a kind of reasonably safer range. 
But the embarrassing thing was that the control group working on their own uh, didn't know any better, and so they went ahead and got better also, even without the assistance of a therapist. And there, and there was no difference between these groups over time. Uh, so I moved to New Mexico and thought the finding would go away. Uh, but I replicated it in 1978, in 1979, in 1980, three separate randomized trials. Talk about being in denial. You know. <laughs> and I finally decided I had a real finding here, that, that, that there was something going on. Now, was it just an artifact? When one thing we had people doing was keeping records of their drinking. And when we asked people, what helped you? One of the things they said was, well, it was keeping those records that you told me every time before I had a drink, I was supposed to write it down. And I'd get out in my car, ready to have a drink, and I'd look at it and say, well, now, do I really want that drink? And I, I think maybe I've had enough, and I'd put it away, and that was really helpful. Or maybe it's just the passage of time. Maybe it's, it's just that people come in, and once they come in to say, I want help with my drinking, uh, they're, they're already done. So we designed another study with the same two groups in it, 10 weeks of uh, behavior therapy, self-help group with uh, what we came to call bibliotherapy, that's giving people a book to take home and follow, or a waiting list, uh, where we told people, we'll, we can't see you now, but we'll see you in 10 weeks. And one of them, we said, meanwhile, keep these diaries of your drinking, thinking that perhaps that was the active ingredient. And the other group, we, we said, just, just uh, wait, and we'll see you in 10 weeks. And what we found was, once again, the, uh, the group that worked with the therapist cut their drinking in half, once again, the group working on their own, who actually started somewhat higher than the, uh, than the therapist group, showed a very nice reduction in their drinking that maintained well over time. And the two waiting list groups didn't go anywhere uh, up until 10 weeks. And then we, we treated them, the therapist saw them, and then their drinking came down uh, after that. So it wasn't just the passage of time, and it wasn't the record keeping. In fact, the group that kept records, their drinking went up a little bit over time. You know, so. So it, it wasn't that uh, either. And the lesson seems to be that people seem to have an impressive capacity to change themselves if you believe in them, if you tell them that they can, and give them some help in doing so. And there are now over 30 randomized clinical trials showing the same thing, that, that a relatively brief form of counseling can bring about substantial change in drinking. Then I got to thinking about that waiting list control, because you, you would expect people to get somewhat better. I mean, they've walked into a clinic, they've said, I have a drinking problem, I want to get some help with it. Yeah, and it's absolutely flat. It doesn't improve at all up to 10 weeks. And then it hit me that, that they were doing exactly what we told them to do. They were waiting. You know? We put them on a waiting list. And the message is, you're not expected to get better until we can treat you, and then it's all right to get better after that. And so they complied very nicely with, uh, with that instruction. We have that kind of power to communicate our expectations to people about what will and will not happen uh, in their lives, and they become self-fulfilling prophecies. I also noticed something else. I noticed that our counselors uh, had, had quite different outcomes. That, the, that one, of the, one of the things that seemed to be determining who was going to reduce their drinking, who was going to manage it well, was the counselor that they saw, and there were big differences. And this turns out to be true in, in the alcohol and drug treatment field more generally, that, that one of the big influences on the outcome is the therapist you happen to draw, the person that happens to see you. Well, what's that about? So we did this study quite a while ago, as you can see, uh, out, out in the Wild West. There were nine therapists in this study and, and three supervisors, including myself. And we were, this long enough ago, we were sitting behind one-way mirrors watching these uh, therapists do their work and rating them on a variety of things, including using the uh, Truex and Karkoff scale of accurate empathy right out of Carl Rogers' laboratory. To what extent are these therapists listening well and understanding and communicating back to their clients what the client is experiencing? How good are they at reflective listening, basically, is what this scale is. And we randomly assigned problem drinkers to counselors, so there wasn't any differential uh, assortment there. And we agreed rather well uh, who was the most empathic. We just rank ordered the therapists, and all three of us picked the same person as most empathic independently. And uh, all three of us, uh, two of us had the same person as the, the least empathic, uh, and the other supervisor rated that person as number eight. So the overall correlation was 0.87 in, in the rankings. 
Then we lined up our, our therapists from most empathic, number one, to least empathic, number nine, and we looked at their success rates when we got the follow-up data. And there they are. Uh, that's a pretty good correlation. That's a pretty good relationship. It's not perfect, but we got a couple therapists where every one of their clients is doing well, numbers one and three, and down at the bottom, we got a therapist uh, with 25% uh, of their clients doing well. And in this study, we also had a group going home and working on their own with a book. And here's their success rate. And if you average all the therapists together, you come to the conclusion that therapists are no different from self-help conditions. But that isn't really true. We've got five therapists who are doing better than the self-help condition. And then we've got a few where the client would have been better off going home with a good book. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what's that about? It's about empathy. We can predict client drinking outcomes, very behavioral stuff, from empathy, how well the counselor is listening to and interested in what the client has to say. Uh, and here are the correlations, if you like, statistics. At six months, the correlation between <laughs> therapist empathy and the number of drinks per week is 0.82, which is doggone good for psychology. It accounts for two-thirds of the variance in, in client outcomes. A year later, we're still accounting for half the variance in drinking. Two years later, they can hardly even remember the name of their therapist, you know. We're still accounting for a quarter of the variance in outcomes based on how good a listener, how good the, the therapist was at Rogerian empathy, accurate empathy. Well, that was, that was kind of impressive. Okay, so... <clears throat> I wish I could watch the whole thing. I've seen this video probably, I don't know, a couple dozen times. And I still love watching it. Um, but what's so amazing about that, about the research that he vetted out, was that the accurate empathy um, accounts for two thirds of the outcome for, for your patients. Um, and that this is not only true for um, reducing substance abuse, but also improved mental health outcomes overall. This is the, these studies the show empathy in general is such an important factor as a counselor. And you would think as human beings, it's something that comes naturally, but it turns out you kind of have to be trained to do it well. Um, good training programs, good education programs will focus uh, skills where you learn how to do some empathy. And I can, I'll talk about a little bit about that. Um, but this is uh, really important that you remember this. And empathy and sympathy are different. We'll talk about that as we get into it. Um, but what do you guys think that's about? Why does accurate empathy help someone change their behavior? What is it? Just whatever comes in validation, you know, of their experience, connection. Yeah, provides meaning and purpose. Right. You know, <clears throat> Um, I'm a practicing a therapist. I'm a substance abuse counselor, mental health counselor, and problem gambling counselor. I have my own practice, and I train, um, uh, supervise, uh, I supervise uh, uh, counselors in training. So um, one of the things, and I remember probably my second year of clinical practice when I was out in the field, I was working with a high school group, and it was a group of young girls who were cutting and had exhibited behavior of self-harm. So suicide alley was a big factor. And um, this, this, you know, a girl, young girl, probably 15 years old was describing her experience about um, the kind of some of the abuse that she had uh, sustained in her family, uh, that she didn't feel like anybody cared. And she had a lot of anecdotal evidence that, that, that indicated, yeah, there wasn't people that cared about her and her family. They told her as much. And she said, you know, if nobody cares, what's the point? And that, that struck me. It was kind of like a, a light bulb when I'm at it. It's true. If nobody cares about you, or at least you feel that way, what's the point of being here as a human being? Because human beings don't exist as a one. We exist as a group. We exist in, we come into existence in families and in communities and um, within cultures, within the context of these groups that uh, are specific and general to different degrees, but they're so important uh, and it defines what it is to be a human being. And so from that, I never forgot that. And so empathy is something that provides us um, 
with the understanding that this person does care. They might not love you and want to take you home and, you know, uh, become a family member, but they care enough to listen. And that can shift and that can awake someone's compassion for themselves. So when you give compassion, that resonates within the individual and then the individual um, displays compassion and self-love. And so then they say, well, do I want to keep destroying my life with this? Or do I want something else? Because this feels really good right now. I'd like more of this. And I always tell uh, patients I'm working with, you know, the way to get compassion is to give compassion. So you want a really good friend, really good uh, a relationship. Um, you got to you gotta play the part first and then it comes kind of like an echo to you. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great comments here. I don't want to mess up my rhythm now, but I'm kind of glancing here now and then and I'll stop for a minute so we can ask questions. Um, one of the great stories I have about Bill Miller is a friend of mine, we were taking a, a trip down to New Mexico and in the morning she said, I have a surprise for you. And I said, okay, what's that? Because we were just going to go to some galleries and look at some art and then go on a hike or something. She said, I emailed Bill Miller before we left Vegas and asked him if he would be willing to have coffee with us. And he, him and his wife are going to meet us this morning for coffee. And I was like, are you kidding me? Because we're both big fans of his, his research, both substance abuse counselors and, you know, worked in the field for a lot of years. And so, um, yeah, he just on, on, you know, he was uh, available and was gracious enough to accept us. And um, here's a picture I think I have. I was a little bit early in the morning, but I was a little tired, but uh, he came out and met us and, and we got to meet his wife and talked about his work and some of the projects he was working on and, you know, spent an hour with him. But um, really neat guy, um, told him I was a big fan of his work. And he was like, you know, he was really humble, but, you know, I don't, I, I'm sure he knows the impact his work has made, but, in his, but he also kind of um, played it back to that, you know, it was a lot of other researchers that he, he kind of built his work on. And I, I, I see that too, but like I said, he, he codified this into a protocol that's really been helping people. Um, and to be honest, um, a lot of um, um, substance abuse counselors weren't trained in this, so they didn't use it. They had, they had the kind of these negative attitudes there towards their patients. And he kind of mentioned that when he started working with patients on the, the CD ward. CD is what we used to call uh, chemical dependency. We don't call that anymore. There's a lot of been a lot of evolutions in terms of how we regard patients. And I want to remind everybody, as a as a professional, um, as a healthcare provider, we don't call people by their diagnosis. So if somebody has uh, a patient has uh, has a uh, substance abuse issue, addiction doesn't exist in the in the in the medical or mental health vernacular. Uh, that is a symptom, but we don't call people addicts. People might refer to themselves that way, or uh, they might identify that. But as a as a professional, we we don't identify our patients as their their disorder, um, their diagnosis. Just like if you had cancer, you wouldn't want people calling you cancer, or if you had diabetes, the diabetic. Or if you had schizophrenia, the schizophrenic. You see how it's a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a way of um, objectifying the person as their their disease, and that is not who they are. They have a lot more potential. So I try to use their names, or sometimes we have to use numbers. And whenever I regard somebody that way, I'll say, you know, the patient suffering from the disorder, schizophrenia. Patient, it takes a little bit of effort, but it's worth it. Um, because when people start to be labeled as what they are, um, they start to believe that just like all of us do as social animals, right? If I tell you you're a good person, then, you know, you might react that way to me. If I tell you you're a bad person, you, you might react to me that way. So important as we, as social animals, we pick up on cues from one another. And Bill Miller mentioned that he said, you know, the patients I was working with didn't act that way. And it's because how he regarded them with respect, with care, with understanding. And those things um, make a difference. And they, they say, oh, this person believes I have value. And maybe that person hasn't felt like they uh, had value for a long time. And this is why they engage in this self-destructive behavior. But then they, we start to change them a little bit and say, I'm important too. I'm part of this human experience. And this uh, doctor here who, seems to care and uh, about me and seems to think I'm worth it. So, you know, it's little things that make the difference and you have to be really careful and it's really important and it goes a long way. 
Um, so um, in, in kind of meeting people where they're at, um, we're going to get into, um, let's see, some of the, some of the tenets of uh, motivational interviewing. Sorry, my, my window's being covered by this chat here. Let me take a, a, breath, a breather here and ask if anybody's had any specific questions as we're going along. Um, can a counselor show too much empathy? Um, that's a good question. I would say that it should not dominate everything. Um, and there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. And sympathy is I feel sorry for you. Empathy is I feel what you feel and accurately feel what you feel. And I've done it and demonstrated in a way that you understand without asking that I know how you feel. And I'm going to give you guys a quick lesson on empathic listening or what we call active listening. Um, and it's very simple. Um, it's, I, I call it the ECM system. The emotion, we identify the emotion when somebody's talking. So you're, I'm going to just mute Ashley here. Uh, who's that one to ask that question? Uh, Jenna Marie. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, Jenna Marie um, is telling me a story about her life. And uh, uh, I, I hear, as I'm hearing the story, I can hear she's, there's anger, there's sadness, but there's a dominant emotion that's carrying through. And so I'll say something like, uh, oh, I, okay, but betrayal, there's some betrayal here. You feel betrayed by this experience with your best friend. And as she's telling me the story, so there's the emotion, the E part of ECM. And then there's the content of the story, you know, um, Jenna Marie put her trust and faith in this friend. They've been best friends for 15 years. She told her something in confidence and she, she put a Facebook post about it and, and uh, kind of outed her to all these people on Facebook in a very public way. And so that was the content of the, um, the experience, her, her, and so all the while I'm validating that, you know, and so there's the, the emotion we got, the betrayal, then the content, and I reflect that, wow, and then the overall meaning, and, you know, and you felt betrayed because you gave this to her in confidence, she knew how sensitive this was to you, and how much it would hurt you to, for that information to be shared, and that broke your trust, boom, there she's like, uh, Jenna Marie's like, yes, you got me, and in five minutes, I can do that when I sit down with any patient, and I worked hard to learn how to do that, but I'm telling you, I connect with them so quickly that they're ready to work with me. And they're like, this is the counselor for me. And a lot of folks will tell me, you know, they work with counselors, they didn't like them. I've heard horror stories about uh, patients going to, to work with different types of uh, mental health providers and getting really poor service. And I think a lot of it has to do with just poor training. Um, and I was trained by some pretty good folks. And so I'm pretty confident and I have great outcomes. And I'm not the best, but um, I like to think that I'm well trained and I try, I try to pass that training on to you folks as my students so that you're well trained and it, and it comes through in everything that I ask you to do for your coursework. It's never busy work. It's always something that is, I think, is important to the field and to be being a good provider. So um, just remember that ECM and it takes a little bit of time to do. And of course, you're going to have different um exercises and coursework and training as you go along. And it takes a long time to become a therapist, but that's okay, it's worth the effort. Um, but I did want to kind of early on, kind of as we're talking about it, what it looks like. So um, I'm gonna come back to the stages of change because uh, it's kind of a little bit out of order about what I wanna talk about here. But um, one of the main things that MI is utilized for is, um, resolving ambivalence. And ambivalence is being on the fence. Yes, no. I want to change. I don't want to change. I'm not sure if um, it's worth it. You know, I've been engaging this behavior a long time. It's kind of my thing. It's kind of who I am. Uh, a lot of people identify with their life, you know, sometimes their substance abuse with their lifestyle. This is who I am as a person. Well, they've been doing it for so long, they don't know there's another way to live without using drugs. Um, and so the first part as we're listening is recognizing Self-doubt is a factor in ambivalence. So sometimes people think I can't do it. And that's why I don't even want to try doing it. So rather than looking, we would, before you know, this kind of research and training came out, we would say, oh, the patient's not ready. They just need to hit rock bottom before they get it. They need, they're not um, open. You know, resistance is not a client's problem. Resistance is a therapist's problem. You're, use, you're utilizing an intervention that is overwhelming the patient. So back off and come at them where they're at. Meet them where they're at. 
Okay, so um, if you say, well, this is our programming, you're not meeting that. The, the hardest thing in the world for people to do is to do something that they, they don't know how to do. If you ask somebody to do something and they can't do it, it doesn't matter how hard it is to you or how simple you think it is, it, it seems impossible to them. So you have to meet this patient where they're at and build that those skills up slowly. A lot of it is skills and it's about learning. It's about introducing the skill in a way that the person can understand it. You have to remember some of these folks have been using since they were children or teens um, or, or young adults and they haven't, they haven't had the opportunity to develop because substances have been um, kind of saturated in their brain, disrupting learning processes. So they have a real deficit in terms of learning, growth, development, and maturation. So sometimes when people stop using, they are where they started when, um, when they left off developmentally. Let's say somebody started abusing drugs and alcohol when they were 12 years old. Sometimes they carry a lot of those traits of a 12 year old adolescent and, and they'll recognize, they're like, why am I so damn immature? And I'm like, you never had time and experience to develop because you were kind of zoned out um, through your drug and alcohol abuse. You didn't, your brain wasn't able to learn, retain information and grow from those experiences. And sometimes, uh, a lot of times, uh, growth and change uh, comes with pain, right? We learn not to do something because it's painful. Well, when you numb and escape feelings and emotions uh, and experiences because uh, the use of alcohol and drugs, you don't have that opportunity to, to learn from it. It happened to you and you might have an inkling of it, but you, you didn't have time to reflect on it and to learn and grow from it. Um, so directly trying to persuade somebody or punish them for inaction can lead to this, what we call a paradoxical response, where you, you, you entrench the person into their belief system. You know, the more I come at you and say, and because, you know, if you're just telling people, you need to get on board with our program, you need to stop using and stop. This is not going to work. They're going to say, you know, first of all, you don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. And you haven't even gotten to know them yet. So this is why empathy is so important. It builds what we call a therapeutic relationship and a therapeutic bond. Once that is strengthened, sometimes you can, you know, you can give it to them really straight on and say, okay, you keep telling me you want to change, but I have seen little effort on your behalf. But I can't do that early on. We have to develop a relationship. We have to develop trust first. We have to develop that rapport, that therapeutic rapport where they, where they feel I care for them. And then they can tolerate a little bit of, um, you know, tough love, so to say. I don't do it very often, but every once in a while you have to. Um, but, but you don't do that uh, until the relationship is strong enough to tolerate it. Um, okay, for those of you, um, there's 95 folks here. This is, I'm really excited. This is the, the largest group I've had in, um, in our symposium so far. So thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I did uh, mention that there's a password for the event that you put into your assignment, and uh, the password for the event is empathy, empathy, empathy. So you go into your assignment, you type in that, you submit it, and then you'll get um, points for attending the, uh, the symposium. If you didn't come, which you folks don't have to worry about, you have to write a paper and submit that for credit. Um, it's a summary of the event, so they have to watch the video afterwards. So when you come, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot easier on you as students to just... Uh, to, to participate in the event live. And then you just type in that uh, password for the event and then you get credit for that. I'm gonna repeat it at the end. So don't, don't worry if you didn't get it just now or you forget and we'll type it into the chat um, moving along here. So um, I know I've been talking a lot, but I got a lot to cover and we've got about half hour to go. I might not get to it all, but that's okay. Um, I will um, provide you guys with uh, copies of the slides and some uh, some other support material for MI. But does anybody have any questions about um, what I'm talking about so far? I know it's a lot. Okay, nothing right now. So getting back to the lecture here. So the, the spirit of MI is collaborative. So we're working with the client. We're not telling them what to do. Evocative in terms of evoking an emotional response. In many cases, emotions move us towards action. So. If, um, if, you, if you don't feel something, a lot of people tell me, I hate emotions, I wish I didn't feel anything. If we didn't have emotions, we wouldn't be motivated toward, towards things. A lot of you, I, I can just hear from, from some of the comments and discussion, a lot of you are motivated towards human services as a field 
and as a profession because you've had your own experiences. You want to help people. You want to make change. And you have an emotional reaction that drives you, right? That it motivates you towards, towards all the work that you have to do to become a, to get through one of my programs. And I know, I want to apologize right here. I know the classes aren't that easy. I know I expect a lot out of you and I expect you guys to be uh, good at research, good at writing, you know, good at studying, um, to bring your best to the table. And I will say for the most part, like 95% of you really deliver. And I really appreciate the hard work you guys put into your courses. Um, one time my Dean, Dr. Donnelly audited one more my courses. She's like, you don't have to have that much coursework in your program and I said I do to prepare the folks um, to the level they need to be to work with people and she backed off because she kind of knew where I was going with it I was basically telling her keeping her nose out of my business which she lets me do because um, she respects me and I respect her too but I knew where she was coming from um, but at the same time if the program isn't challenging for you um, we're not going to grow and so that's another um, aspect of of why the program has a certain amount of rigor to it because otherwise uh, you know if it's too easy that it doesn't force you to to grow um, and that challenge is how we grow it's like if you go to the gym and you just do the bare minimum you're not going to see any results right um uh, but going back to um emo evoking an emotional response so as we're listening to people about this issue and we're let's say we're talking to them about their substance abuse i'm going to pick on April because I just hear her name up there and say, if I asked April, you know, why is it you want to change? What is it you want to, to, to see different in your life? And she said, I can't keep going on this way anymore. My life is not going the way I want it. You know, I'm just, just making all this up. This is not a, a discussion April and I had, but it, it, it helps her to connect with her emotional experience. And then that emotional experiences drives the motivation towards change. Right? Does that sound? Uh, does that make sense? And then uh, autonomy—that the, the the patient has the right to their own determination, their their own independence and freedom to make whatever choices they want to. So I don't punish them. I don't admonish them. I don't show disapproval or judgment. Because let's say I have a patient come in to my treatment facility one day, and then they don't change, and I'm like, Bill, you got to get out. You know, you're not keeping up with the program. You, we know you you um, pop for a UR which or UA which is a urinalysis, and you had a you know a dirty test come back and so you're out of the program and you really disappoint me and I can't believe you're wasting my time and to be honest I think you know everything we've done for you um, it just it, I feel like you're really ungrateful so I make all these judgment calls against him you think he's going to come back in for treatment if he ever decides he might never come back to treatment at all because he might feel so ashamed. And this is not our job as professionals. We're supposed to be objective. We're supposed to be compassionate and understanding. And relapse is a symptom of addiction and, and part of the patient's pathology. So we don't, we don't punish people. Just like if you had a patient who had diabetes or cancer or some other disease, you don't make them feel guilty for their symptomology, right? Um, let, let's say they... Uh, I don't know, have poor circulation in their lower extremities from, from diabetes. You're not going to tell people that they're, um, they're not trying hard enough. They don't care. No, these are, this is a symptom of, of the disease of, uh, and progression of diabetes. So relapse is, is part of um, the symptoms of, of uh, substance abuse disorders and other patho and pathologies related to it. So we, we work with it and we find ways to help change those things, but we don't do it by, through judgment, through admonishment, and through rejecting the client. So let's go back to, you know, <clears throat> Bill, this made a patient of mine, you know, Bill, you know, these are some of the rules of the program. You, you came back with a, um, a dirty urinalysis. So we're gonna to have to suspend you from the program for 30 days that you're welcome to come back in. Um, if you wanna get clean again, you know, we'll put you back into the detox unit for five days and then you can come in to the um, group counseling and then um, residential care or whatever. You know, I'm just making this all up. Uh, and you know, and to, I'll remind, this isn't personal. This is just, we, we can't have you using while you're 
in a residential program with other people that are trying to get clean, those can be triggers and they can affect um, their, their treatment outcomes. And I know you want the best for, for, for the folks that, you know, are in the program too. And, and they usually understand, but if I, but if I approach him that way and let him know he's welcome back at another time, or maybe we find a better program for him, something that meets his, his needs. Maybe he needs something a little bit stricter. Maybe he needs outpatient care. You know, we got to find whatever balance it is. And that's my job as a clinician. I'm trained to identify where people are at in terms that are deep to their disease progression and to, to match them with treatment that has a better likelihood of, of, um, of meeting their, their long-term goals, which would be probably in most cases abstinence. Um, so um, we, don't, we don't take on our patients' uh, failures as our own. We don't get upset or we don't get resentful because if we try to own every time somebody's successful, we don't own our patient's success nor their failure. We are there to help and provide an environment to where change is possible. We are not there to make those choices for them. Those are up to them. So um, this, this MI spirit must be authentic. It's something that has to resonate with your own values as a provider. If you don't believe in this, if you're kind of like, um, you know, you've got a completely different value set, then you're going to have a hard time um, be, delivering these uh, skills and interventions in an authentic way. Uh, this aligns with my ethical values, so these principles are are easily easy for me to incorporate into my practice. And so, what does it mean to be authentic? Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. We probably will run out of time, but uh, uh, but um, that's okay. We'll do the best we can the time we have. So, what does it mean to be authentic? And so, I thought about this when I was pre preparing this lecture tonight. And one of the things I work when I'm working with folks um, as developing professionals, as um, students, as counselors in training is self-esteem. And what is self-esteem? Self-esteem isn't just looking in the mirror and say, you're the best, you're the greatest, you're awesome, good for you. You know, this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't Pop Warner football where everybody gets a, a trophy and a blue ribbon and a cupcake. This is real life. And we can only esteem ourselves if we respect ourselves. And we do that through a, a variety of methods. This is a list of um, qualities and characteristics of self-esteem that was vetted out by Nathaniel Brandy, who's a great um, researcher and uh, presenter on self-esteem. He There's a great book, if you're interested, called uh, The Six Pillars of Self-Esteem, which I adopted from, from that text here. And so there's these six pillars is living conscious, consciously, excuse me, consciously, self-acceptance, self-responsibility, self-assertiveness, living purposefully, and personal integrity. And there's some definitions on here that I don't know if I have time to read all of them, but it, they're worth taking a look at. Because if you want to have self-esteem, these six um, aspects of self-esteem support the whole. If one of them fails, just like um, a pillar that's pillars that support a building, the whole building comes down. So if you're not living uh, consciously with self-acceptance, accepting responsibility, uh, assertiveness, you know, and, and so one of these phenomenons that comes about is when people become professionals, they'll say, I have imposter syndrome. I feel like I'm not supposed to be here. I feel like I'm just a fake. And I'll tell them that you need to work on your self-esteem. There's all these um, self-help books and uh, seminars that you can go to. Actually, somebody at one of the colleges was running it, and I was thinking, if they're not addressing self-esteem, they don't know what they're doing. This is an important aspect of it. And I've been, I've been uh, a mental health counselor for 11 years now. I work with students at, at lots of different um, uh, institutions. And I'm gonna tell you, this is a, a really important factor if you wanna be a healthy clinician because we have to be healthy individuals. We don't have to be perfect, but we have to be aware of kind of where where we need to work on and get there because without that we don't have the confidence we need to deliver the kind of care that is required for the patients that we're serving. So the, the challenge of a counselor or a, a service provider or a human services professional would be without conscientious living or critical awareness we lack confidence. Without uh, confidence we cannot feel assertive because how, how can we assert ourselves? We're just 
Okay. We're just faking it. Without integrity, we cannot feel self-respect. We cannot esteem ourselves. Without purpose, we lack direction. And if all these ideas are not in accord, we lack integrity. And integrity is the, the things that all the things in your life are going in the same direction, which gives you an incredible amount of strength. If you're, if you're, you know, if that's like if you're a cop on, and on the weekends you're like you're into the, all these illegal activities, you don't have integrity in your life, and you're going to screw your life up in a big way if you keep doing that. Uh, if you haven't already, nobody can <clears throat> get away with um, who they are. We all pay in some way or another, and it's so important that as as professionals that that we maintain a level of integrity and awareness of ourselves that that we're able to, to really deliver who we say we are. Um, you can't go out uh, stealing and murdering people on the weekends and try to be a good therapist during the week. It's not gonna work. So some of the principles of MI um, are expressing empathy. We talked a little bit about what that looks like. Remember empathy is feeling what the other person feels, not feeling the way I think they feel, right? I'm listening, I'm hearing, I'm watching their body language, I'm watching their emotions, and then I'm, I'm making an accurate expression of their feeling. I'm not faking it. I'm not sympathizing. I'm like, oh, that sounds terrible. You know, what's the first thing that happens if you tell somebody <clears throat> that somebody important in your life died? They tell you, oh, you know, my grandma passed away last year. That is not empathy. That, they're, they're reflecting on their experience. Now I'm there for them now instead of their, them being there for me. This happens all the time. Um, it's a big mistake. People do it all the time. They don't do it, I think, to be malicious. They're trying to find a way to relate. Uh, and, but it kind of comes off to people when they're in these very vulnerable states that this person's just telling me about how they feel. They don't really aren't concerned right now about how I feel. So it's so important just to listen to them. And sometimes there's nothing to say. And you can just be silent with them and share a moment. And that's enough. Developing discrepancy, so um, rolling with resistance and then supporting self-efficacy. And we'll go into some of the, what, are the, what these things look like. So listening skills, um, how, how do we listen effectively? Uh, suspend your own thoughts, quiet the mind and your beliefs when listening. You're not gonna, here to make judgments or evaluations. You're just listening. You're just receiving. Allow yourself to feel what others are feeling. Um, a lot of times folks don't want to do that and they don't want to hear people's sad stories or um, horrific experiences because they start to feel it, right? If I took a hammer right now out and I smashed my hand, you, a lot of you would might grab your hand and because we have empathetic, we're called mirror neurons in the prefrontal cortex that let you know how that would feel if that happened to you. It's We have empathy neurons down to our uh, central nervous system, we have a, a, a way of understanding how other people feel to, uh, down to physical pain. Some people are so empathetic, they actually kind of almost have like this phantom pain when they see things like that. And you've probably seen some horror movies. I don't watch horror movies. I'm very, I don't need to, I, my patients give me enough real life stories. I don't have to watch that stuff for entertainment. Um, but so a lot of times people will, will shut themselves off because they don't want to deal with that. But as as counselors, as um, professionals, we are, that's what part of our job is. And so we have to learn to be able to tolerate that. Um, it, it isn't, you know, you, you just have to know that the difference between you and them is there. They're not me and I'm not them. So it's happened to them, not to me. Um, the other thing, um, sometimes people think, oh, if um, I'm afraid I'll agree with them when I don't agree with them. Um, and that will change me somehow. So let's say somebody did something and, and, and part of their empathy is like, um, they feel enraged about the experience, but you, you have a different attitude like, oh, well, I kind of seems like you got what you deserve because you shouldn't have been doing that. You know, and if you, if you empathize, then you might agree that, oh yeah, they're, they have every right to be enraged. That's not what we're doing. We're not engaging in a value uh, evaluation. We're, we're just feeling with it. And this is the important part, suspending who, you think you are for the moment so you can hear and then once you hear and then you're able to reflect that um, th this is a part of the, the process of active listening or empathic listening um, recognizing some uh, discrepancies um, pointing out obvious contradictions i hear what you're saying but it doesn't seem to mesh with your behavior so you're telling me you want to stop drinking but every night this week you've been drinking 
How's that? So I'm not judgmental. I'm just pointing it out kind of in a non-judgmental way. Um, pointing out differences between behavior and the person they believe themselves to be. So I've consistently heard you say that you're an honest person, but in, in, as you're telling me the story, there's a number of times where you were dishonest with the person you were dealing with. What's that about? You know, just so what we're acting as is a mirror, a kind of like an x-ray to them, you know, um, being a perfect mirror, not with judgment, but just reflecting exactly what you're seeing. And of course, this comes with developing trust. So they recognize that you're not, you know, this is why you can't be your a counselor to your best friend. You can't be a therapist to your family member because the way they act affects your life. But patients come in and we have, you know, this therapeutic distance and we develop this therapeutic relationship where that isn't a factor. So we remove that. So it's for the clients uh, better, better able to trust the therapist and feel they're being more objective. So com comparing and contrasting stated goals with stated actions. Um, <clears throat> and then rolling with resistance. So not arguing, not trying to make your point be right. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't change. This is, you know, I see people, you know, online and political arguments, people aren't going to change their point of view just because you're arguing with them. It doesn't happen that way. People change their point of view by listening and learning. And if they're not open and receptive to that, they're not going to change. And so how do be, people become open and receptive to learning? Well, there's something that they choose of their own volition, of their own free will. They say, I'm interested in this and I want to learn more about it. So when I, when I train folks, I tell them, I need you to be open um, to learning new things that might change the way you think about this, the world, yourself, your own value system. Can you do that? Yeah, I think so. Or I'll try. But at least they're open and willing to do it. People don't change if they're not willing to accept new information, right? If they're just going to be dogmatic in their belief system. So this is why in a university system, in a, in a, in a college um, um, academic program, this is possible because people have made the choice to come here. Nobody's forcing them. This is the great part about college. You don't have to come here. This is something you take because you want to. Um, so we don't participate in the conflict. And this is what I, uh, one of my, the interns that I supervised, she had a great way of putting it. Um, she said, I feel like I'm playing tug of war with the patient. They're arguing this way and I'm arguing that way. And she's like, what do I do? And I said, just let, let go of the rope. Don't, we don't play that game with them. We're not here for that. We're not here to change their mind. Let them go to the depths of their feelings and their thoughts about the matter, and they'll make a change and a decision if they want to change on their own. We're just giving them the space to express it. Um, and so then in their own reflection and their own evaluation, they can make that choice. So we're reinforcing autonomy, that the client has the right to be themselves, have their own free will. But, and this creates optimism, a different way of being because they feel like, wow, this guy lets me or this gal lets me be who I want or what I want in this moment. Because of course, people are different when they're in the context of different people. So therapy is a very special place where you create a bubble of safety and, 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 and trust around um, you and the client so they can talk about whatever they want without any judgment, without any consequence to what they say. Now, we have to be honest, we have scruples as human beings and sometimes you hear things that just make your stomach turn. But, but if you can be kind of objective about it, like this is what this person telling me, this is what they feel and then I reflect that, I don't have to agree with it and I don't have to like it. But I can be not judgmental because that's what it's required of me. Um, I guess when I'm looking at this, this is a very, uh, was a popular movie when I was a kid. It's called War Games. I, mean, I was thinking uh, most of these kids probably weren't even born when this movie came out. Anyway, um, but one of the great quotes from it, um, they taught the computer um, how to not engage in nuclear um, aggression, uh, that the computer came up with the idea the only way to win is to not play the game. And this is what we do. We don't, we don't, we don't get into these kind of um, offensive arguments because they don't they don't serve our purpose in terms of helping the client change. A lot of times, that's the first thing people do. You need to do this. You need to do that. Telling people, 
uh, explain to them why they need to change. That doesn't really work for people, you know. Um, we got about 15 minutes left, but I wanted to ask any more questions. Caleb's seen it, cool. Um, are there any questions as I'm going along that have come into your mind about? There is a question that I think it's very important to answer. Um, I mean, all of them are, but this, this is uh, important. Um, is MI counseling? Mm, no, it's a tool we use in counseling, but we can use it in different things. So you can use this for any type of situation where the person wants to change, right? And this can even be you, like, I want to do this thing different. So rather than when you're, so I think the, if I'm hearing the question right, it's, um, can I do this? Can I do this? Or does, is this only reserved for therapists and counselors and people who are trained uh, providers? No, I would say that this is a way of engaging someone, a style, um, and it's proven to be more effective. And so the reason why I would say that anybody can use this is because we are always considering the autonomy of the, of the person that we're, we're interviewing, if you want to call it that for in terms of motivational interviewing. We're just trying to find out where the person lies. All we're doing is using a line of questioning that helps them open up and enhance their emotional experience regarding the matter. We are not doing any kind of um, psychotherapy, so to say. Um, but it's an important part of the change process, for sure. Um, you know, I can write a pamphlet on motivational interviewing that a, a, a 10 question uh, a questionnaire that, that you could take that would help enhance your motivation towards change. So I would say that it's not, it's, um, it is a, a method that we use that is helpful in evoking change, but it is not, uh, we're not manipulating people to change in the direction we want to go. Because some of this stuff, see, it sounds all, well, the way I'm describing it, it sounds like great, but sometimes patients will recognize, I do want to continue using drugs and alcohol. It is a lifestyle that I enjoy and I have not had any significant consequences and I don't need your help, thank you. And so I haven't encouraged them, I've just elicited their attitude and belief about the situation and that's it. Did you have any thoughts about that, Gerardo, as I'm talking? I think um, just to emphasize and reiterate what you said, utilizing motivational interview is not about changing the individual. It's about respecting their autonomy to this and the decision-making process of, I want to change. And if they don't, I mean, you know, if you are not in a psychotherapeutic process, of course, you, you leave it like that. But um, it's more about allowing the individual to see where is that desire to change, if any. As, um, as, a, as a counselor, you need to be super attentive to those subtle ways of the clients demonstrating, yes, I think I do want to. And then we grab that and expand that into, now let's figure it out how. Are there any plans? How are so it's about evoking that change through our communication process. Um, and it was funny when I read the question because um, Miller will say it's not a technique. <laughs> it's a little more than technique according to him, but yet it's not counseling and psychotherapy, but it's using there. So it's, it's all this combination. I see it as a tool, a beautiful tool that can be used and apply in any single context. Um, and, and, and another question that follows with that one is, so empathy, motivational interview and counseling. Um, I think that empathy is an element of both. As a matter of fact, empathy is at the heart of motivational interview. Without you being empathic and the idea of respecting the autonomy of the other individual will not happen. So, right, because empathy in of itself doesn't change the other person. You might feel the, the you might be empathic and feel what somebody else is feeling, but if you don't communicate that to them, what good does it do to them? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, and so the, the the qualities and aspects and principles of MI 
uh, um, are congruent. And th that's illustrated in this um, Venn diagram here, where there's an intersection of these things and they all resonate, they harmonize um, together. And that's, uh, you know, this collaborative autonomy, um, empathy. Uh, that's not the one I was looking for, sorry. Um, let's see if I can get to it. Um, we're almost there. So um, just because they're running out of time, I might not develop some of these ideas as much as I'd like to them. Uh, so one of the other uh, things that we wanna do is promote self-efficacy. That the, that the patient has the capacity and understanding that they have the ability to, to execute change in their own life. Now, sometimes they not, might not believe in that. So we're gonna spend time digging into what we know about them and then giving them examples of where they have been efficacious. I remember I had a patient that was uh, addicted to methamphetamines for like 18 years. And she said, I don't know how to do anything but find meth. She said, you could put me in the middle of the desert in the middle of nowhere and I, I, I wouldn't be able to find food or water but I could find meth. And I'm like, so you, so you have a skill, <laughs> you know? And I said, all we have to do is turn that towards something that supports the kind of life that you want and you'll go as far as you want in life. Uh, it was kind of funny at the time, tragic also, but she had some skills and she didn't believe that but I helped her understand that, that she could generalize some of those skills that she had um, to finding the things that she needed out of life instead of, uh, you know, kind of pursuing this drug seeking behavior. Um, so just uh, one of the things that, that you might need to remember is this quote by Gandhi here. If you have the belief that you can do it, I shall surely, acquire the capacity to do it, even if I might not have it at the beginning. So the road, the struggle, the journey prepares you um, for, uh, to develop the person you're trying to become. This is why when I talked about um, incorporating academic rigor and, 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 and scholarship into our degree programs is a part of helping you folks develop into the professionals you want to be. You can't get there. If college was easy, everyone would go through a program and finish it, but it's hard. And it takes a lot of work, discipline, self-determination, failure, uh, picking yourself up again, uh, developing self-efficacy, letting recognize that you can do this. I'm sure some of the assignments you, you look at, like I did when I was in college, I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to do here, but I'm going to give it my best try. Um, and, and, I will tell you a secret. Sometimes the assignments are vague to develop a creative process for you to fill out the expectations. If I tell you exactly what to do and how to do it, I'm just gonna get a copy of the same assignment from everybody, right? But if I leave some areas for you to fill in, it allows you to engage your creative energies and problem solving skills. And that gives you more self-efficacy because you're gonna build on that. I did it once, I can do it again. Okay, and I'll tell you the reason we pay human beings money to work in, in professional settings is because it requires problem solving skills that require the engagement of your creative processes. So uh, using your brain at a higher level, not just following orders and, um, <clears throat> and outcomes. We're trying to get you to think creatively on how to solve problems. And as if you're hearing me talk about working with patients, you'll probably recognize that you have to be creative in how you're engaging them because every patient is different. That means the, the, the method of psychotherapy that you're going to use is going to be custom tailored to the individual every time. That sounds a little daunting, but when you've done it and you've had enough experience and training, you'll, it's like being a musician. You know how to play all the notes in different ways and you can put it together any symphony that you want and it, and it, and it works. And this is why it takes so long to become trained to become a therapist because you have to learn how to um, how to apply these skills in a way that's going to create the outcome that's that the patient needs and for you know and to, to meet them where they're at. Okay, um, how much we are on time? We're about five minutes left. Let me see what I've got left here so I can I don't run out of time. Um, I'm going to go to the summary right now because I don't want to. Uh, leave anybody hanging. Uh, I want to finish my presentation um, and then ask, uh, open up uh, the floor for any questions. So it just as a recap, motivation, 
motivational interviewing is uh, the motivation to elicit from the client and not impose from outside forces. So recognizing that we're just listening what's within them, we're not telling them how they should feel and react and think and all that. It's the client's task, not the counselor's, to articulate and resolve his or her own ambivalence. So something like a question would be like an open-ended question. What's keeping you from making these changes? Not, you know, um, in, instead of asking a closed-ended question, why haven't you done this? You know, or, or will you do this? You know, yes or no, leaving it open. Um, direct persuasion is not effective for resolving ambivalence. <clears throat> Uh, the counseling style is generally quiet and elicits information from the client. So your patients should be talking more than you. If as the counselor, you're talking more than your patient, then they're just getting a lecture from you and um, you're not listening because you don't have enough time to get to know them. Um, and especially early on in therapy, I'm doing a lot of listening in my first few sessions to really get to know my patient to, to a level that I, we can develop that trust. And the whole time I'm building on that by um, letting them know I understand them and, and in, a, in a very accurate way through active listening. The counselor is directive in a way that helps the client to examine and resolve ambivalence. So we're not just not doing anything where there's an intentionality. And part of that is to, to elicit questions that or to ask questions that elicit um, their reasons for ambivalence so they, they can resolve them um, as after they've had an opportunity to reflect on them. So readiness to change is not a trait of the client, but a fluctuating result of the interpersonal interaction. So you know this, some days you might talk to somebody and feel really motivated toward change and other days you might talk to somebody and not. So if we have a positive attitude towards the client, we're non-judgmental, we, we kind of join in their enthusiasm towards change in, by empathizing, even sympathizing, this I think would be uh, appropriate, then, then that enhances and increases their uh, readiness towards change because they can see, oh, I could do this. Um, and then lastly, the therapeutic relationship resembles a partnership um, you're kind of walking the road with them. You're supportive, but you're not doing for them. <clears throat> I don't have enough time to get any skills, um, but I wanted to um, just take a few minutes to answer any lingering questions that you might have. And hopefully this was a good introduction to you for motivational interviewing. Um, I think I saw the link. Um, there is a Google link that has some some resources for motivational interviewing. I'll, I'll put it right here. You should be able to get to it. No, that's not it. Okay, I'm going to put it in the chat window here. Um, so hopefully you can get to that. There's... um. Uh, a little pocket card for some of the MI skills, uh, a handout and a tip sheet. So these things might be able to help you um, as you're, as you're, you know, deepening your understanding of MI. Um, any other questions before we run out of time? I like to start on time and end on time and respect everyone's time. I really do appreciate everyone being here. Uh, it made my night to see 96 participants, um, all the questions. All the interaction is great. Um, uh, yeah, thank you guys for your comments. Um, and hopefully those other, uh, oh, the password again is empathy, empathy, empathy. Uh, I think I put it one last time in here. Password for the event is empathy three times. Um, thank you all for your participation tonight. I hope you're all well. Um, that you're enjoying your academic program as challenging as it can be sometimes. And if you need something, reach out to Gerardo and myself. We're here to support you through your, your uh, educational experience. And we hope that you're finding it to be worthwhile and meaningful. Um, that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. So thank just you all. Very, Go ahead. Just very, quick, just very quickly for everyone. I have sent um, um, a form, a Google form for those students that are part of grade-based in college. 
Um, I'm, I'm, looks like um, if you are not logging into the Great Basin College, it will not allow you to complete the form. But I'm going to authorize you. So just keep refreshing your uh, the link until you get to it. So you, you set that link out in the chat window? Mm hmm Yeah. Okay, great. So, but because it's not being um, completed through the GBC email, it's blocking individuals. But I'm 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 authorizing you guys in the independent. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. So it might just be under your G, your GBC drive. Mm -hmm. Um. So the other thing, uh, just really quickly, that that um, survey that's coming out is just to, to to see interest for the bachelor's program that we have. We already have. Uh, 18 folks um, that are declared major in the bachelor's program and it's coming along really nicely so it's a it's something that if you're not aware of gpc offers we have the associates and then that does the first two years of the bachelor's and we have the bachelor's the last two years of the bachelor's program um so um yeah the form is it's just it's just a quick survey uh, yeah, it's for the the Nevada State College students. You don't have to. This is really uh, well. You can if you like. It's, it's up to you. Uh, but it's going to be. Um, we'll we'll get it out to folks. We can send it through um, Starfish too, so we can get it out to you. All right. Well, we'll um, any other questions? Remember, you can uh, always uh, call, email, text me. Um, I'm usually pretty responsive. I want to thank everybody again for attending and have a great night. Um, and we'll see you uh, uh, at the next meeting. Uh, please look for the announcements. We're going to be having uh, quite a few meetings this semester. So hope to see you all there. Thank you. Good night.